Okay, hi everybody, and welcome to Letter Processing. So I'm gonna introduce myself, my name's Aaron. I am helping moderate the session, and I'm the first talk. So I'm gonna get us, keep us on time, and get started. All right, so today what I'm gonna talk about is the semantic priming across many languages study, performed by myself and nearly 300 other people. All of their names are listed online with the Psych Science Accelerator. So first, let me tell you about the Accelerator, because it's an amazing project. I see several familiar faces in the audience. It's a CERN for psychological science, where we have a globally distributed network of researchers with more than 1,000 members across 82 plus countries. And it's a group of people who work on big team science projects We're using open science principles and practices. So specifically, this project, I don't know how I got lucky, I'm 007, um, but it's fun, and we have another fun acronym, everybody calls it the SPAM, because it's the spam uh, and what we're doing is looking at priming, which is why I'm here today to talk to you. So this is gonna be a spoiler alert, because it is the first set of results from the study. We're nowhere close to done. So I know most of you are cognitive folks, but uh, so I'm preaching to the choir, but semantic priming has a rich history in cognitive psychology, and it occurs when response latencies are facilitated, made faster for related word pairs in comparison to unrelated word pairs. It's usually measured with a lexical decision or a naming task, and um, the semantic priming project was a big inspiration for this, and Keith is here, so happy Keith and Emily. Um, and it provided priming values for a ton of English word pairs in first order and other order associates. And I distinctly remember talking to Keith about this many years later, and he said, if I was to do it again, I wouldn't. And then I wouldn't use SOA, so we didn't. Um, and I feel like this project is an extension and a good replication, so we're adding to the data we already have, not quite totally replicating it. But semantic priming in general replicates pretty well as we talk through the replication crisis. Uh, one issue in this field, though, is the use of weird words, right? So it's English-dominated research performed by English-speaking individuals written in English. So we have a lot of data sets that are English-focused, right? And so it's either on English trying to understand brain organization or representation or similarity, or if there's more than one language in the study, it's focusing on multilingual individuals. How do you keep all those words in your head, right? And how are they organized? Which is very important work. However, I'm the like data set person, so I'm trying to match data sets to think about cross-cultural comparisons. And by the time that you start doing that, you realize what the problem is. That to put everything together into one study or one comparison, the overlap is not very good. So how can we leverage the computational skill sets that people in NLP are using with open data sets to make this better? And that's where we're going today. So the goals for this project are to assess semantic priming across at least 10 languages. That's what NHB wanted. Six are done. Um, provide a large scale data set for reuse in cognitive psych. And this is a registered report at Nature and Human Behavior. So how do we pick the stimuli? Well, we use the Open Subtitles Project. This is so such cool data, and um, if you want to see some cool analyses on it, Gary Lupian's done a bunch of stuff. And, and that's because subtitles we found are critically useful. They are amazing. They're very good for our assessment of word frequency, which is then very predictive of a lot of different things, but especially response latencies. And so it's a set of data, 63 languages that are downloadable. About 43 of those languages are usable for our purposes in this project. So what we did was we took the top 10,000 most frequent nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs using the UDPipe package. And then from there, we took the top five cosine values from Substivec, which is a project that used the open subtitles project to build word-to-vec models of every language. So from those um, word to vec outputs, you can find the most similar words. So that's about 50,000 pairs in each language separately. 
Then you cross-reference them using your best Google Translate Kung Fu. <laughs> it's about 1.2 million pairs, and you pick the ones that overlap the most. So to me, this is where the big important point, it's a thousand final word pairs that are driven by language, language the way people language, not English. And so we didn't take English and then translate into everything else. And I think you'll see that in the results. And I'm, I'm quite proud of this because I'm trying not to continue to do the weird problem. Um, so the, the words are picked by being the most frequent and similar things in language. Now, non-words are tricky. Uh, so we generated them using a Wuggy-like algorithm because God bless Mark, but I cannot get Wuggy to work anymore. And so we kind of wrote our own using the same principles where um, for each syllable, you replace another syllable, trying to keep the same length and transition probability. Then we have translators check everything because I don't speak Danish or any of the other languages. So having them make sure it translates in the proper form, noun, verb, adjective, and meaning. And they are allowed to suggest. So they can suggest words that best represent the match between Q and target, and the best words that, um, that keep the Q and target as different words, because they don't always translate into different words. So all of our pairs are matched on target with as close of a Q match as possible. They also fix the non-words to make sure that they are pronounceable, but not so fake it's super obvious. So we want the task to be somewhat difficult, but not, super, not crazy. Okay. So uh, dialects are also considered and separated when appropriate. So Portuguese is separated into Brazilian and regular, but the Spanish team got together and did some magic, and it's all just one version of Spanish. Okay. The procedure, I have a, I have a um, code at the end you can also use to look at it. But the overall task is a single stream lexical decision task. All the keywords are judged, so this is the di big difference between the SPP and ours, is that every single word gets a judgment, which actually provides us with more data than we had before. Uh, trials are formatted as a 500 millisecond fixation cross, followed by the Q or target in lowercase font, uh, so we're not queuing them by using uppercase for some and not others. And then they make a decision. Is this a word or not? It's uh, keyboards are wild and it's 800 trials. So it is very boring. <laughs> I have tested it so many times. It is super boring. But the keyboards are wild part. Um, what we're doing is keeping the hands on either side. The keyboard as close to the shift key as possible. If you've never thought about how many different Chinese keyboards there are, I have a surprise for you. They're all different. Um, and then uh, what keys should I pick for Russian? So we've spent a lot of time talking and looking at different keyboards to make sure that people's hands are generally here-ish and not here or here, you know, keeping them uh, appropriately spaced. All right, so how do you power such a study? I mean, there is a hypothesis here, but in general, it's just trying to collect a big data set. So power, what we did was we focused on using um, accuracy and parameter estimation. You can see anything by Ken Kelly on this work. It's really great. Where well, your goal is to find a sufficiently narrow confidence interval for your parameter of interest. So our parameter of interest is the target words. And so we're trying to make sure we measure them well. And then priming is what it is. Okay. And so we simulated using the English Lexicon Project and SPP for their response latencies and figured out through a lot of math that the minimum should be about 50 people per target word, and that's in the related condition and separately in the unrelated condition. That's a stopping rule. Once they get at least 50, it'll keep sampling the word pairs that don't have, that are uh, more variable so we can get our narrow confidence interval. So a stopping rule is where the standard error reaches 0.09. And then at 320, all bets are off. It just gets sampled at the same rate as everything else. And so this allows us to put the data where we are most uncertain. And so we'll have different sample sizes for each uh, pair, but at least 50 per target word. And so it's an adaptive sampling procedure. So about once an hour, because of the data has gotten so large, we can't run it every 10 minutes like we used to. It uh, samples the data, creates a summary, tells it which ones to run next. If there are a bunch of people going to take the study at once, like through Turk or something, we have five or six versions so that not everyone's seeing the same random sample. 
All right, so what are you going to get at the end, right? So subject and trial level data for every participant. You can see every word they saw in the order they saw it, when they saw it, and all their browser information. The item level data, so just averaging together, here are the average response latencies for each item, their average percent correct, and all that kind of stuff. And then obviously the priming data, which is what I'm here to tell you about. So each um, item, unrelated minus related, matched by the target word. So what do we got? This is my big reveal. <laughs> so we have about 7,000 plus participants already. We started data collection this fall. I'm super excited about this. Big thanks to ZPID. They're a German university who helped provide three of these samples, and my university who provided two of them, and then everybody in the US who's just been collecting data like crazy for our English sample. I'm super proud of the fact that we have uh, Latin-based scripts obviously uh, Cyrillic with Russian, Korean, and Japanese. We're also going to minimally collect Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish, and German. Those are the other four that we have to do, but then there are like 15 or 20 in the queue waiting for this presentation to be over so I can put them online. So I think we have either 20 or 24 that we're gonna collect at least some data on. Danish team got together and actually got some funding for theirs. So we'll have a full collection of Danish. It's a bonus language. So here for the ones that have the minimum data collection, what do we get? And um, I was uh, telling Keith a minute ago that if you pick up the SPP's data distribution and put it on top of ours, it's almost exactly the same, which makes me very happy. <laughs> um, and so the bar here for each one of these is the um, mean. And then they're just the distribution of the data. We do have some long tails for Korean and Japanese, but otherwise they look pretty good. And there's priming. Phew. Right? I don't have to explain to NHB why we didn't get priming. Um, if you compare them directly, so a bit more obvious for the confidence intervals, English is the weird one. It's the lowest. Now this is Z-score level priming. This is about 20 to 35 milliseconds give or take, if you un-Z score it across everyone. So English is clearly lower than our three here that are not Latin scripts and the other two Latin scripts it overlaps with. I don't know if that pattern will hold, but it's very interesting. Um, and the other thing, the reason I think English is super low is because we didn't start with English. So there are definitely pairs in that data set that are not super high cosines because they were back translated from a different language. And so we do have a wide range of cosines to be able to look at to see why some of them work, some of them don't. So if we line them all up, they're not in any order within language here. You can see that about 70% of them work, meaning the priming score is above zero. And um, that's exciting. But the more exciting part, working from zero here to six, right? So how many of the word pairs, once you line them up and they're matched for translation, how many of them work? There's one word pair that works in no languages, and I can't remember which one it is. No. Sorry. Um, I like, totally forgot this morning. And then I forgot to look it up because I got so excited. So <laughs> going this way, though, but there's 19% of pairs that work in every single language so far. So yeah, yeah my word nerds. Um, <laughs> We get uh, another 32% that work in at least five languages, and then another 27% that work in at least four. And this is gonna be so cool at the end with the cross-cultural comparison ac across all of these. Now, Romeo and Juliet works really great in all languages. I do have that one for you. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to see that it isn't a total mixed bag, but that does not mean that they are correlated at all. So, um, you probably can't read any of the numbers here because it's too small, but if you look at the dots, you can see that there's almost no pattern. There's a slight positive correlation when they're lined up against each other. So a lot of them work when you dichotomize work versus not work as yes, no, but the correlation between matching items is somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2. And that's probably because they have different uh, semantic or associative strengths within their own cultural language. So let me wrap this up here. Um, I, this, I'm so excited. This work diversifies the participants that are available in our studies. Korean is really hard to get, so I'm super excited. 
it, it diversifies the languages that we can represent in the study and the researchers represented in this study. And that's really aided by big team science and a whole huge group of people that I'm so grateful to work with. Uh, priming effects are found across these different writing systems because that was a big question in our study. Uh, variability between them seems to be about 0.2, so it's not large, but it's not zero. And more languages are currently underway. And if you are interested, we're still collecting data collection teams, so we still have can have people join us. Um, even if you're doing English, while well, I said it's done with a minimum, I would like more data so we can look at item level priming effects because Tom Heyman just really wants to know. Um, all types of researchers are welcome. You don't have to be any particular type of person. You just have to be able to collect data. Authorship is provided for those folks who meet with um, the collaboration agreement, which I can explain more to you individually. And everybody who has helped in some way or some form or clicked a box on our study is listed online on our GitHub. With that, I'm happy to take questions. I don't know. No. Um, so obviously, uh, da, 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 back up. Obviously, yes, right? All of these down here and some very big ones. Um, I've started to look a little bit at like links. Uh, if the word links are very different between the words, right? So the, the one that's longer will take longer for obvious reasons. Um, and the cosines, because not all the cosines are very strong because of the translations. Yeah, there are some some other things because you can't perfectly control all of the things that influence RT across all of them. Yeah, Alex. Okay, that was like eight questions. <laughs> um, not all monolinguals, because can you find monolinguals in Europe? So, no. Um, we do ask them their native language, so we'll be able to tell if they're taking it in their native language. You can also see what the language the browser is in, um, which will tell you something else. And then one or two folks are doing specifically doing some L2 and L1 people with some questions about their how their, what they think their linguistic ability is. So there will be a little bit of that, but it wasn't a big focus. But that data is kind of there. Oh, yeah, one more? Yeah. yeah uh, so how do you make sure you just the semantic priming effect, you know, sometimes for the lot of priming? Because, for example, I think those transcripts, like in timing, uh, car and uh, mm -hmm. uh, train both have vehicle car, and uh, that kind of or maybe the multi-level priming. Right, or um, orthographic level yeah. priming, right. So for the Chinese specifically, I had like a meeting at like 10 o'clock my time because I uh, was talking to that team. They're trying to do their best to control for it, and we try to do our best, but it's there. So given the word stimuli set, you would be able to like classify phonological and orthographic to see how much it impacts the final results. Okay, maybe one more. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. But is there anything to connect this in the about which type of words to be published? I don't know because I made that graph like three days ago. <laughs> um, I haven't figured, no, I haven't looked yet, but I am interested in that question. What makes it, I'm interested in what makes it work and not work and work across languages, but then you're the same idea, like why is it working? Yeah. Don't know yet. All right, definitely all my time. Thank you guys so much.